Welcome to the College of Complexes. What? My name is Don and I'm going to be the moderator this evening. What? Our program tonight is how the KKK grew to have 5 million members. Our speaker is Dale Lackman, who's right here. All right, now Dale Lackman, author of the new book for the Kingdom and the Power, the big money swindle that spread hate, um, that spread hate across America, it tells how advertising, PR, and mass communications tactics were used to exploit fear in every corner of America, including the infiltration of Congress. All right, now let's have a warm round of applause for our speaker this evening, Dale Blackman. Hi, I'm Dale Lackman. Uh, I have written my first book, The Kingdom and the Power, uh, Big Money Swindle That Spread Hate Across America. And I want to tell you a little bit about myself. For 20 years I was a uh, television producer, director, and writer. And then I became a history teacher. And I have taught now for a number of years, 6th graders, 7th graders, and 8th graders. And that's interesting to try to connect in teaching history and social studies to kids of that age. Um, so I would try to get anything I could to get them kind of connected. Uh, and one thing I would talk about is a time machine, which the kids instantly are paying attention when you talk about a time machine. And I, I live in Wilmette and, and talk there. And I would tell kids when we, when we talked about French explorers that we would get our time machine set it for 1673 and take our lawn chairs down to Gilson Park right on Lake Michigan and we'd wait there until from the right going to the left we would see birch bark canoes with black robed men in them and we would be seeing uh, Father Marquette and Louis Joliet going right past that, uh, back home after their trip um, exploring down the Mississippi River. That gets kids connected so I'm going to try that with you guys. I'm going to get out my time machine and I'm going to set it to, let me see the exact date here, August the 16th of 1921. And we're going to take our lawn chairs and the time machine and go to Old Rand Road heading northwest out of Chicago. And it's going to be at night and, and we're going to see coming from the city and heading out towards Lake Zurich 2,000 automobiles with their headlights on going past. Now, people that night claimed that it took over two hours for this entire procession to go past their home. And inside of every car were hooded gentlemen. And they were headed for a farm near Lake Zurich, between Barrington and Lake Zurich. And once they got there, they went to a large field. Uh, a number of the automobiles formed a huge circle, a half a mile in diameter and turn their headlights on towards the inner part of that circle. They set up an altar or two, they set up uh, uh, bonfires, and 10,000 clansmen got inside that circle. And the Grand Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan from Atlanta, Georgia was there, and it was for a, an initiation of new um, members of the Klan. So, also, coming out among those 10,000 were 2,700 men in blindfolds who there um, that night became new members of the Ku Klux Klan of the Chicago area. Those are big numbers for Chicago, don't you think? The Klan is known to be pretty much a southern organization. And it was originally, but my book is about how it got to be a whole lot bigger than that. Uh, an interesting sidebar to that story is the man who owned the farm, yes. who allowed them to use the farm that night. Kind of reminds me of Woodstock with the Gasper's farm. Well, this is a different farm. Um, the man's name was Charlie Wiegeman. Now, does anybody know who that was? Fairly famous Chicagoan. Charlie Wiegeman. Any hands? Any hands? Wrigley Yes. Charlie Wig This is the 100th anniversary of Wrigley Field. Yeah. Doing you know the different uniforms of every decade, they're doing everything about it. Well, Charlie Wigman built it in 1914. He uh, owned. He was a restaurateur, made a lot of money in Chicago. He actually owned a. I think the Chicago Whales of the Federal League, which went under. Then he bought the Cubs and he built Wrigley Field and moved them from their other field that they were playing in to Wrigley Field in 1914. And I think in 1920 he sold the team to the Wrigley family and it was renamed Wrigley Field. 
he was the sponsor of this Klan event in August of 1921. Now, what I read about is that we can't tell if he was exactly a Klan member or more of a Klan sympathizer, but whatever the fact is, he loaned the Klan uh, his farm that night. Now, I will tell you that less than one year before that, there was not a single Klansman in Chicago. There was not a single Klansman beyond the state of Alabama, states of Alabama and Georgia. In a really short time, Chicago got organized and a lot of other places in the country. Now, there were Klan events in Oregon, in Kansas, in New Hampshire, and other places. I grew up in Michigan and my brother sent me a couple of articles that the Grand Rapids Press uh, published a couple of years ago. One of them is shows a picture of the Klan parade on July the 4th, 1924, down the main street of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Now, you wouldn't exactly expect Grand Rapids, Michigan to be a hotbed of Klan activity. <laughs> but there were over 6,000 people in the parade alone, and a lot of other people, Klan's people, were watching. So um, the Klan from around Michigan went to Grand Rapids for this big event. Now, um, one year later, there's a picture here of an enormous Klan gathering in Jackson, Michigan, of over 100,000 from clans all around the state of Michigan. And at this particular event, the new imperial wizard of the clan actually appeared at this one. Um, so it just kind of shows you that the clan isn't the clan you think about. Um, very few people realize. When I told people that I was working on this story, and things that I miss, I'm sure you're going to ask me in the question and answer. Uh, no one has ever heard this story before. When I told the story about um, some marketing people who grew the Klan to five million people in every state of the Union, they, they look in disbelief, and then the next thing they say is they want to hear the whole story. So uh, I've yet to meet a person, maybe there's somebody in this room that's heard this story before, then you would be number one. Um, and I want to, I guess I want to fill you in a little bit on, on the history of the Klan. Oh, I have one thing to read, read for you out of the book. Probably the most famous clan gathering is one that you've seen in history textbooks. Almost every history textbook since I taught history has, when it gets to the 1920s, a photo of the clan marching down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. I'm sure I'm going to see some nodding heads on that one. That's the one picture that really shows about this story. And, and this story is the reason that that enormous gathering was there. I'm going to read just a very short excerpt out of my book uh, because it has a quote from H.L. Mencken, very, very famous journalist of the Baltimore Sun. He was there that day and he, he reported on it. Okay. The most searing images of this time are the photos of over 40,000 and I've heard possibly 60,000 roped Klansmen parading down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. on August 8, 1925. Famed newspaper man H.L. Mencken was there to observe. The parade was grander and gaudier by far than anything the wizards had prophesied. It was longer, it was thicker, it was higher in tone. I stood in front of the treasury for two hours watching the legions pass. They marched in lines 18 to 20 solidly shoulder to shoulder. I retired for a refreshment and was gone for an hour when I got back to Pennsylvania Avenue. It was still a mass of white from the Treasury Building to the foot of the Capitol Hill, a full mile of Klansmen. This was quite a spectacle. And the Klan um, also became extremely organized in terms of changing the politics of the company. They, they became so large that they were politically um, powerful in many states of the Union, Indiana probably being the most of all, where they elected the governor and almost half of all of their legislature. Right, right. And uh, places like Kansas, again. Um, they also tried to influence the president's election of 1924. Um, I'm going to read here. The Klan and Evans, who was the, the wizard at that time, boasted of influencing the 1924 presidential election in favor of Republican Calvin Coolidge. The Democratic National Convention that year was a highly contentious affair. Evans had two objective objectives at that convention. He wanted to thwart the nomination of Al Smith. And, uh, and he was Catholic. 
That's the reason they wanted to. We'll talk about that later. Okay. Yeah, and defeat the plank uh, in the party platform condemning Klan violence. He won on both counts. Smith was a big city Catholic and a vocal critic, critic of prohibition. And the Klan was anti pro was very much for prohibition. Um, Evans' backing went to a Klan friendly Californian named William McAdoo. Chaotic Convention nominated a compromise candidate, John Davis, on the 103rd ballot. Democratic Party was fractured as a result. Many party members fled to liberal third party candidate Robert LaFollette, who La who's from Wisconsin, I believe. Uh, conservative Republican Cal Coolidge won in a landslide. When the Klan violence flag was defeated, Klan was defeated, 20,000 hooded Klansmen met on a New Jersey field across from the convention headquarters. The gathering was known as the Klan Bait. The speakers urged, uh, urged violence against blacks and Catholics and attacked effigies of Al Smith. This must have been quite a spectacle. Okay. So having done all of that, the first line of my book is, this is not a Klan book. It's really about a couple of people instead. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about the Klan. The Klan had its beginnings right after the end of the Civil War in Tennessee. And the story is that about four to six young Confederate officers were bored out of their minds. As you can imagine the excitement of battle and the war, and suddenly it's over. Uh, so they decided to uh, make an organization. They were all college men, and they had been in fraternities. So the Greek word for circle is kuklos. So they began the society, and they called themselves a clan. And they decided later to change the, you know, kuklos has a K, clan has a C. So they said, well, you know, for alliteration, we'll have a K for clan as well. So it's a kuklos clan. They started pretty much by terrorizing blacks, um, who were now starting to get rights and the ability to vote and things like that during the Reconstruction in the South. Um, they took uh, great glee in scaring blacks who felt that they were in their sheets, the ghosts of Confederate dead. <laughs> um, but eventually they became more and more violent. Part of that is because Reconstruction was very tough on the South. Uh, the U.S. Army was there enforcing it. Blacks were now beginning to vote. Um, the life of the Southern white was changing dramatically. They weren't happy about it, so they started to try to control through fear um, and terror uh, the blacks and any whites from the north that were helping them. And there were, uh, there were, uh, there are examples in my book of thousands of people voting in a primary, and by the time it got to the actual vote, only a couple uh, of, of blacks who would have voted against uh, the southern ideals. So, it got so violent that the U.S. Army actually put it down. Uh, U.S. Grant, uh, they passed a number of laws in Congress, anti-Klan laws, and the, the army came down and pretty much uh, they put it out of action. Uh, George Armstrong Custer was actually there because they sent the 7th Cavalry. Uh, and as it turns out, they didn't really need the Klan anymore at that point because once the U.S. Army left at the end of Reconstruction in 1878. 77. 77. Okay, thank you. I got to be on my toes with this group. Um, the Klan was not terribly necessary anymore because, as you know, the South pretty much reverted back to the way it was before the Civil War. The U.S. government really wanted no part of trying to enforce very much, so they let the South kind of do things like they had done before with Jim Crow laws, uh, lots of other things like that. A lot of the former slaves were economically depressed so that they often were still on the land that they were on when they were slaves, only now as sharecroppers. And as sharecroppers, uh, they were kind of in a box. They, they had to give half of their crop away to the white owner of the farm. The white owner set all the prices. If they had to buy things at the, at the store, it was like a company store where all the prices were controlled. And essentially, it was rigged so that, that blacks could never get themselves out of that situation. So, South's a pretty terrible place, and laws were pretty much supporting it down there, so the Klan had gone out of existence. The second plan is the one I'm talking about. The second plan started in 1915 on Thanksgiving night on Stone Mountain, out just outside of Georgia. It was begun by a former Methodist minister, former fraternal organization organizer named um, William Joseph Simmons. And um, it's a very dramatic ceremony took place on Stone Mountain. 
coincided with the movie Birth of the Nation debuting in Atlanta, which is all about the Klan as well. And it was, it was launched, it was back. However, William Joseph Simmons was a terrible organizer. He was a charismatic speaker, but there was no follow-through uh, as, as an organizer. Four years later, by 1919, um, he had mortgaged his house, he had no money, he had two or three thousand members in Alabama and in Georgia. They were not organized at all. Uh, the Klan was broke and it was about to die. So, how do we get from there to these gigantic um, things that I talked about in the 1920s? <clears throat> well, what happened is really what my story is about. My story is about two people, a man and a woman, who owned an ad agency in Atlanta. It was Edward Young Clark and Elizabeth Betsy Tyler. They owned a, uh, a PR ad agency called the Southern Publicity Association. And they were real groundbreakers. There's, there's actually a, a chapter written about them in a history of PR by a college professor. Um, brilliant, groundbreaking breaking people. Really forerunners of public relations marketing. Um, they did a lot of uh, uh, not-for-profit work. They also, their biggest client was the Anti-Saloon League. Anybody heard of that one? That was, uh, I saw Ken Burns speak at the Union League Club uh, a couple years ago. He was uh, talking about the debut of his um, documentary in WTTW on Prohibition. And he mentioned the Anti-Saloon League, and he called it, I think, the largest single issue uh, lobby in the history of America. They were enormous, and obviously, they were effective. Uh, Bessie and Edward were uh, the PR firm in Atlanta for the Anti-Saloon League. It was their biggest client. Now, when Prohibition happens, that's a really bad deal for Bessie and Edward. Because they just lost their biggest client. There's no more need for an Anti-Saloon League. Um, so timing is kind of everything. We have Simmons mortgaging his house. Uh, and the Klan about to go under. You have Edward and Bessie having just lost their biggest client and in really dire economic um, stress with their own agency. Well, they decide to take a real risk. They decide um, to take on the Ku Klux Klan as a client. And they, they go to Simmons, they, they, they pitch the, the fact that they could be his propagation department, his membership department. And they sign a contract, a very lucrative one for Edward and Bessie. And they go about setting up a national sales organization. They're really good at this because this is like the golden age of fraternalism. Everybody in America, oh, it seemed almost every man was part of some fraternal organization or another, many of them multiple. Simmons himself was said to have belonged to 10 to 12 uh, of these organizations. It's what people did in those days. And there were two, there were really two types. One was the secret organization like the Klan. And the other one was an insurance organization. And there's still those around as well. Um, basically, they provided benefits for their members. And some of those were also kind of secret. So not only were they providing things like insurance, they were also providing the meetings with the fancy costumes and the secret handshakes and, and all the things that people seem to like to do. It's a big deal. It was a big draw. One of the biggest ones then was called Woodmen of the World. Have you heard of it? Yes. 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 I've heard of them. Um, yeah. They're still around, too. Yes, they are. There's a big skyscraper in Omaha, Nebraska, which is like the home of the Woodman Insurance Company. Mm -hmm. So they're still around. Uh, back in the 1920s, uh, I looked up some research and saw pictures, and they had pretty outlandish costumes. They would, they would pose with an axe in their hand because they were cutting down wood, clearing the clearing uh, the place where their families could have security. Uh, there are um, written down uh, sets of rules in, in, in their ceremonies, and they're, they're quite lavish, where uh, there's a hierarchy of people just like, a, you know, like the Masons or anything like that. Um, turns out Simmons and Clark were both organizers for this organization, so they were well versed in this type of thing. They were good at it. So what they did is they took the entire United States and split them into, I believe, nine domains. And inside of those domains were states, which they called realms. 
um, they put a, a sales official over each domain and then another one over each realm. And then they sent salespeople out into those areas. They were called clegals. And in my book, I talk about everything involving with the clan started with K. Um, so these clegals would go out and they would um, go, to, go to various towns, set up, set up shop there, and start talking to people. Um, a lot of them uh, were people already in fraternal organizations. And as I'll talk about a little later, they tried to find out really what was bothering uh, people in those towns. And then the clan would say, we're, we're also bothered by that, and we're with you. And, um, and a lot of it had to do uh, by finding the local minister and getting him involved. And what would happen is, and this is called single level marketing, where if that legal would find somebody who wanted to join the clan, they had the power to sign them up that day and collect a $10 membership fee. You know, I think in 1920, that's about $125 in today's money. And they would immediately take 40% of that. It was a $4, uh, $4 uh, cut they immediately took and put in their pocket. I saw um, after looking something up today, and they said that uh, the job of Kleckel in the 1920s was one of the better paying jobs in America at that point because the money was just flowing into their pockets. And I'll talk about why they were so successful. They would take the, the, the remaining $6 and ship it to their head of the realm, who would take, I think, a dollar, who, a dollar and a half. And he would send it on to the guy over the domain, who would take a dollar. And they would send the remaining $4 back to Atlanta. Uh, and $2, or, sorry, they're in four and a half dollars. Two dollars would go to the clan treasury, and two and a half dollars would go to Edward and Bessie, the, the organizers of the Southern Publicity Association. Um, all sounds good. A lot of people do business plans, they don't always work, right? Money flowed in at an incredible rate. Now, as a historian, I believe very much in timing is everything. The timing that this took place in 1920 was absolutely perfect. It was a perfect storm for them. I don't know that this would have happened five years earlier. I don't know that it would happen five years later. I'm talking about post-World War I America. A lot of things were going on, and a lot of them were scaring the heck out of white people. And a lot of them were scaring the heck out of white Protestants. A couple things that happened. One I'm sure you've heard of is the Great Migration. Great Migration happened starting about 1890 and going from top to about 1960. But they came in different ways. The first wave brought uh, millions of blacks from the south to the north. And I read a book, I think it's, if anybody had heard of Warmth of Other Sons, it was a bestseller a couple weeks, a couple years ago. It's all about this. He said it was not an organized movement at all, it just kind of happened. It kind of happened because life in the south was horrible for blacks. One of the things I was just talking about, the Jim Crow laws segregation, all of that. So they started just getting onto railroad trains, entire families. And um, that is why some cities like Chicago gained a tremendous black population is because it's the end terminus of the Illinois Central. It goes from New Orleans to Chicago. So people got on the train all the way along that route and came and ended in Chicago. Same thing happened in Detroit, Cleveland, other cities. Uh, tremendous gains in population. Blacks found a better life. Not a great life, but a better life. The housing was possibly a little better. They were able to get jobs that paid a little bit more. Um, and, and then more people, when they heard about that, came. So, one of the reasons we have the Klan in some of these cities is, is because it, the black population has moved to other places. Um, another thing that had happened, of course, is World War I. World War I took a lot of white men out of the market, out of the job and, um, field, and took them off to war. Blacks also did, but not in that many numbers, and many of them assumed the jobs in, uh, in industrial America, which was thriving because of the war industry, and, and labor unions accepted blacks, life got better. Of course, what happens is the war ends and everybody comes back. Also, economically, after a war, there's often a recession because you're retooling from a, a military kind of industry to a peacetime industry. So we had a lot of people fighting for very few jobs. 
And you also had immigrants coming into America. For perhaps six years or so, there had been no immigrants coming into America because of World War I. You couldn't get from Europe here. There's submarine warfare, all kinds of things going on. So the war ends and there's a flood of immigrants now coming. And many of them are non-English speaking. And many of them are Catholic. A couple of things that the Klan kind of worked for was that um, we still had a very large white Protestant majority in America. And now suddenly, hordes of non-Catholics, non-English speakers are coming to America. Also, the Russian Revolution had happened. So you have a lot of Eastern Europeans who um, white Americans saw as socialists and were scared of them. I mean, the word socialism is always scared. A lot of Americans, I think, right? It's like a, well, it's like it's like uh, when they label uh, President Obama socialist, in a lot of people's minds, it instantly goes to communist, right? It's just like that. So there have been plenty of red scares. This was a red scare going on at the same time. You have all these things happening. Um, a lot of unemployment. And has anybody heard of the red summer of 1919? Okay, did anybody see last week's Tribune? They do these nice Chicago flashbacks. Have you seen these? Where they go back and they go back in the Tribune archives. This is one of the events of the Red Summer of 1919. One that happened in Chicago and caused riots for about four or five days. Uh, lots of deaths, lots of um, devastation throughout the city. This is the one on the swimming beach in Chicago that was segregated, where a young black man, uh, there's differing accounts, he either swam into the wrong part of the, of the lake, then it's like 22nd Street Beach or something like that, or he floated on a raft into the, into the wrong part, and whites began throwing rocks at him and hit him, and he fell into the water, and he drowned. Um, police were called. There's a lot of anger at the blacks because the whites had done this and they didn't even allow the blacks to try to save the boy. Um, and the Chicago police, of course, arrested blacks. Well, this escalated into an unbelievably bloody. Let me see if I can actually pick out the stats here. Um, yeah, I should have highlighted, but um, hundreds of people died, thousands of people lost their homes over a, a period of time. This was one of 25, at least, incidents in cities all over the United States, geographically diverse everywhere in America. There were bloody riots, including Washington, D.C., um, throughout the summer. And these are blacks fighting back. I, I talked in my book about 10 years earlier, 1910, after the Great White Hope fight with um, uh, Johnson. Johnson and Jeffries. Uh, that when, when Johnson won, blacks began to celebrate because he had done a wonderful thing, and, and whites viciously attacked them, and blacks ran. And ten years later, the reaction was different. There was, there was a fight back. So this makes white Americans really scared, because this has happened, and this was widespread, and this was all over the United States. Uh, so you have that, you have the Catholic influx, you have all this. So, the plan was positioned by Edward and Bessie as uh, native born, so their members had to be have been born in the United States, white and Protestant. And everybody else was out. But that's a huge number of people in 1920, because that's still the great majority of the United States. So by the time they're finished, at its height in 1925, I just did some math, and I think between uh, one out of three or one out of two eligible men in America was a member of the Klan. You take the census and you start limiting all the people that couldn't be in, and that's about how it comes out when you have five million. And it's all these people. Now, if there are some some themes in the story. Um, one would be the misuse of gifts. These How people the were brilliant fries? people, um, but they were greedy people, and, and they cared not a bit. They were not clan people at all. 
they only cared about this enormous amount of money they were making. And as it turns out, they were even cheating their, their client. And I go through a whole lot of things that they were doing. They were to pay expenses of their, of their sales organization from that money that they got back in Atlanta. Well, one of the first thing they did was they hired a new accountant for the clan who worked sensibly for him, for them, and he started taking all the expenses out of the clan portion. Then they started doing other things. Uh, I'll just give one example that's pretty amazing. Um, before they signed the contract, there was a company in Atlanta who made the ropes for the clan. The moment Edward and Bessie signed the contract, they fired that company. And they hired a new company, and I looked up, they formed that, that, that new company was formed the day after the contract was signed. Uh, it was called Gate City Manufacturing, and there were a lot of, uh, a man and a woman were listed as the owners. Well, it was Edward and Bessie. <laughs> they, were, they were making the ropes very inexpensive, selling them at a profit to the clan, and then selling them to the members uh, at a commission. And they went on and on in what they did. So they were... It was bad enough that contractually they were doing a job that they were supposed to do, but they were uh, illegally, unethically, doing a whole lot of other things just to, to amass this enormous fortune. They do eventually get outed. Uh, one of the first things that hap uh, one of the things that happens is uh, the New York World newspaper does a 27 straight day front page expose of them uh, in 1921. Actually. Only about three weeks, this begins only about three weeks after this big uh, thing I, I talked about in, uh, in Lake Zurich. And that wins one of the first Pulitzer Prizes in investigative journalism. They go to the halls of Congress, and, and it's, it's really a fascinating story about what happens to them. They start losing their grip, and Bessie, and Bessie actually leaves to, to go to California. Uh, she has a son who, or a daughter who has tuberculosis, and he, she's going there to uh, to get treatment. But the the word is that in her in her luggage she had eight hundred thousand dollars when she left. In today's money, that's almost ten million dollars. So uh, they did well. She built. She was dirt poor, uneducated um, farm girl from Georgia, and she built a house in Atlanta that's still there, still occupied. It looks like tar <coughs> with the wind on the National Registry of Historic Places. So she did very well. Um, but there's a whole lot more. When you're an author telling about a book, you don't want to tell too much because you hope somebody would actually like to buy the book and read it. Um, so I believe I should stop there because I think you're going to have a lot of great questions. And I actually enjoy having um, a question and answer because I want to know what you're interested in. All right. I just want to remind everybody that all questions must end with a question mark. So, um, okay, let's start with you, Gene. Go ahead. Well, of course, the obvious question is, uh, how much is your book, and how how can we get one? There we go. Uh, it's twenty-five dollars. All right. Um, and all you right. can get them here. You can get them at Barnes and Noble, and you get Amazon. And okay. like, but I'd like to buy it. I brought some tonight. Okay. Okay. All right, <laughs> Sid. Did you have a question? Yeah. At that time, I think it was 1990. There were the Palmer rates. Yes, people, there were. People from foreign countries they shipped them back to Russia or wherever they came from, and there was a hysteria uh, because of the Bolshevik Revolution. Yes. Now, what did that have to do? With the thing that you're talking about. Yeah, there, there, there definitely was a red scare. I mean, history's kind of cyclical because that happened in the early 50s as well, the McCarthy era, right? So okay. it, it's very cyclical. Um, the, these people um, seized upon that and they said the Klan was anti socialist. So they were very much against socialism. That's what they preached their salesmen to say. So again, what they were doing is making a little closed society, actually a large closed society, <coughs> white Protestants. And um, let's say something else. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I have a question. It's sort of a oh, yeah, there was, question. Sure. Was it sure. The Klan was also Louder, Don. pretty anti-Semitic too. Absolutely. And, and didn't they tend to didn't they tend to assume that Jews were always responsible for socialism? Uh, yeah, yeah, and blame socialism on Jews. They always had we can't the Jewish immigrants out and wouldn't have a socialism. I'm not sure if they did that specifically, but I think a lot of the Eastern Europeans who came at the time were Jews and were associated with the Bolshevik Revolution. I mean, I think they just, they, they pretty much were good at just broadly labeling people. So anybody coming from Eastern Europe was pretty scary to them at that point because of socialism, which at that point was brand new and was very, very scary, I think. It only, the revolution happened in 1917, right? Yeah, yeah so this is only three years. And they have no idea what this thing out there is. A couple out of that, I think a number of them were Jewish immigrants at that point, so they kind of tied it all together, I think. Mm -hmm. But oh, yes, anti-Semitic definitely, anti-Catholic, anti anti-Asian, yeah. anti just about everything. Okay, uh, Karina, did you have a question? Um, the, the thing I've been curious about is Indiana uh, almost being south of, really, Indiana is south of Florida. I mean, it's, it's just... Why has the Klan had more staying power uh, in Indiana? I mean, one rumor is that their headquarters are in Muncie. Um, Me now? Yeah, or, yeah. Um, I, I can talk later about the Klan today. But uh, part of, one of the reasons I think it was so strong in Indiana was the leader of the Indiana Klan, a guy named D.C. Stevenson, who got into a lot of trouble. Uh, and went to jail for a murder of a woman. But he controlled in Indiana and was also given about seven or eight other Midwestern states. But he was very proud of the fact that he, can, he had uh, total control in Indiana and many of the elected officials, including the governor, were Klansmen. In fact, when he got into trouble, he thought, he was put into prison, I think, for life. And he thought that he would be pardoned by his Klan governor. And he didn't. And then he got angry and exposed all kinds of stuff uh, from jail. But uh, Indiana was just, part of it was the the strength of the leader in Indiana. Okay, um, Tim, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm interested a little bit about how you came to the idea of writing this book. How long it took you to write the book? Maybe just comment for a okay. couple minutes on sure. how the book Sorry. developed. Sure. Yeah. Like I said, I, I was uh, actually. If I go way back, right, this is one crowd I can ask this. When I was growing up, I got a love of history from reading a series of books called We Were There. Yes. Anybody read it? Yeah. In the late 50s, my elementary school library had about 40 of their titles. And every one of them, it was historical fiction. And everyone had a, usually a boy and a girl of about a fifth or sixth grade age right in the middle of some great historical things. Like we were there at Lexington and Concord. We were there at Pearl Harbor. We were there at on and on, Cortez and Montezuma even. And I read them as fast as I could, always had them. <laughs> I ended up getting a degree in advertising, a master's in TV and film, and went on to be a TV director for over 20 years. But I never lost that kind of uh, love of history. I initially had wanted to be a history teacher and a coach. Um, so I was working on a show at WTPW, just down the street from here, that got canceled. And my wife and I had young children, and we had been using a babysitter, and we decided one of us should stay home with them. She had a great career in finance. Uh, so I stayed home, and by the time they got to school full time, I decided to become a history teacher. And I went to Northeastern Illinois, also right down the block. Uh, and I was in a class on uh, ethnic history, and each, each lecture focused on a different ethnic group as they came to America. So there was an Irish one, there was a German one, there was a Polish one. Uh, on the, on the lectures on African Americans, the professor got to this point and mentioned this story in two sentences and actually got the names of the two people switched. And pretty much he said, this man and woman, Clark and Tyler, um, helped recruit clans people and they also had an affair. And that's uh, kind of interesting. So I filed it, and eventually, a couple weeks later, started researching it in the college library and found that it was much, much more than I thought it was, that it was of huge national importance. And that's how I did the story. I began, I wrote it first as a screenplay, because in my background in radio and TV, or TV and film, I thought more visually and in dialogue than I did. I didn't know I could write a book like this. 
Uh, and I didn't, it didn't sell. I think a lot of it is, uh, that's a lot of money to put into the budget of a film about the Klan because who knows what kind of box office you're going to get. You don't see many, many films about the Klan when you got to spend 50, 100 million dollars to make a film. But I finally got to an important producer on the West Coast who said, really well written, great story, it's a book. So I started thinking more. And as I, get, I did deeper research into what would be a book, I found far more than I ever had in the screenplay. And the story got better and better and better. Um, probably took me a couple of years to write. It took me a couple more years to find a publisher. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Any any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. did you have more to say? No, no. I, okay. I Bill, did you have like, like a school teacher? About, I was calling on people. Okay. Bill, go ahead. Yeah. What about uh, American Nazis? <laughs> okay. We had one here in town that thought uh, he, you know, he said he thought he was an American. And that's why he left the Nazi party. Okay. And. Uh, he gave a pretty fundamental speech here uh, at the college about a year ago about uh, war crimes in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there are a lot of similarities between, similarities between uh, the Nazi Party, or maybe the more radical parts of the Nazi Party, and the Klan. Uh, if you're aware of the Southern Poverty Law Center, anyone? Yes, I imagine. Um, on the back of the book, they gave a glowing endorsement of this book, by the way. But. They monitor not only the Klan, they monitor hate groups in general. There's actually a map on their website called the Klan Watch, where you can click on any state and they'll tell you who they know that is a, uh, like a Klan group in that state. Uh, so if you click on Illinois, though, I haven't done it for a while, but there might be six or seven Klans in Illinois. They tend to be very small. Um, but they also monitor all hate groups, skinheads, Anybody. What's that, web, what's that website called? Again? There are some very radical groups that they want to keep an eye on. Okay, okay. Uh, all right. Who else has a question? All right. Uh, Dave Travis. Go ahead. Uh, isn't it a fact that the Klan is, uh, while they're known for being anti black, uh, isn't it a fact that they're also anti Jewish? anti-Catholic, anti-Italian, uh, and pretty much anti-anything that isn't what they are. Absolutely, yes. That was the genius, in a way, of Clark and Tyler, is that, you know, they were looking to make more, the most money they could. If you're just going to focus the black population, there's a limited amount of money. If you broaden that to all of these groups, the appeal becomes larger and larger. Um, it's interesting, I just got an email from a friend of mine who's a, um, a dean at the University of Iowa. And she forwarded to me an article, I don't know, just very recently, of a Klan group spreading uh, leaflets around um, on Long Island in New York City, you know, outside of New York City. And they, they put a flyer, a really cheaply produced flyer, in the sandwich bags and put candy in it to keep it from blowing away and threw it on people's driveways. And one of the big things they were talking about was anti-immigration right now. Because again, these are not white Protestants, you know, the, their immigration is coming in. You know, so they had an uh, illustration of a, a, a Latin person, a Spanish person. So again, it's all that same basic uh, message that they have. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm a school teacher. I'm used to calling on okay, people. Okay, okay, okay. Just a moment. Let me let me call on people. Uh, sure. Dave Zucker, go ahead. Yes. Were you aware that about 20 years ago there was a made-for-TV movie about David Steve, about DC Stevenson? No, no, I didn't. I should look uh, that up. Yes. Uh, he was a bad guy. <laughs> yeah, I I saw that made-for-TV movie. Yeah. By the way, um, he took a young woman yeah. uh, across state lines. Uh, and brutally murdered her, and they said he even was gnawing at her like a dog. Uh, she wasn't quite dead, so he had his, his aides drag her to her parents' doorstep where she died. Um, and uh, you know, he was found guilty and thrown in jail. Yeah. So she committed suicide. That's, That's right. Okay. You can't yeah. make Europe wrong. You're right. Right, right. Now, she. You're right, she did. Yeah, she was. Yeah, yeah. And. Yeah. Uh, and all right, now, um, all right, uh, Hugh, sir, yeah. did you have a question? Do you have a new plan that the plan normally appeals to people or socioeconomic backing? Uh, 
I mean, people who are well, uh, like, say I do too, okay. people are in the working class, rather than upper middle class type of people. Who are plan members? Yeah. I haven't done a, a lot of research, but my feeling is that they are lower educated, <laughs> lower income whites. Yeah. Um, I don't find a whole lot of intellectual, uh, highly educated uh, members of the clan. I'm sure there are some. All right. All right. In, in where? In Wilmette. In Wilmette. You know what's interesting though is I, I have a book called *The Clan in the City* (1915 to 1930) by a guy named Jackson, written in the 60s, and he claims Wilmette had a clan, as did Waukegan, as did Orland Park, Tinley Park, and many in Chicago. So it really spread. All right, I if I could say in answer to this gentleman's question, you know I've done research on the clan myself, and um, the. Most of the rank and file do tend to come from the working classes, but the leaders of the Klan and other uh, racist groups that tr uh, have traditionally been college-educated, um, upper-middle-class people. Um, and that is true, that was true in the Reconstruction era, as you mentioned, the founders were all college-educated men and were all officer, former officers, and that is true today about the racist organizations today as well. Yeah, let me follow up on that, that um, in the heyday of the Klan that I'm talking about, <coughs> there were lots of uh, more educated people because the Klan influenced a lot of uh, police departments, judges, um, the higher levels of society because the numbers were so enormous. I don't find that today. If I may ask this question, I'm just going to tell you, I, the Southern Poverty Law Center claims that in the entire United States there are around 5,000 Klansmen. And they're all in small, tiny clans of maybe 20 or 30, and none of them talk to each other. The, the, the clan I'm talking about was a centrally located 5 million out of Atlanta. <coughs> this is tiny amount not talking to each other. Yeah. Okay. Um, did, did you, sir, you had your hand up earlier. Did yeah. you have a question? <clears throat> Woodrow Wilson was a great uh, academician and uh, then a president. Mm -hmm. And he and his cabinet supposedly watched the movie, uh, The Bird of a Nation. It's in my book, yes. <laughs> really? Uh, and his comment was what? The greatest movie he ever seen? Um, he said something, it, it, is, it is so amazingly true. Something, it's in, I, the exact quote, it would take me a second to find. Woodrow Wilson has got this great reputation as an academic president of Princeton, um, oh, as fine. the guy who kept us out of war, and then his, in his um, Second administration, we got into war. He was a man who saved the world for democracy. He had all of these positives, but he was, by many accounts, an out-and-out -out racist. He, uh, when he was working at, in Washington D.C., he actually segregated all of the uh, federal workers in Washington D.C., yes. which had not happened before previous presidents. It was integrated. Um, he supposedly told darky jokes in cabinet meetings. I mean, this is taken from a book, um, called, a wonderful book called Lies My Teacher Told Me. Um, talks about, about Wilson. But yeah, he, he really was um, a Southern racist. When he was president of Princeton, it was the only college in the North that uh, did not allow blacks. Yeah, uh, that, that was the only one of the Ivy League colleges, I think, that didn't allow. Was it the only college, actually, in the North? Well, that's what, that's what they're called. Okay, that's okay, never mind. Yeah. Okay. I, um, all right, yeah, and I uh, I can tell you what the quote is, because is, I remember it. Is, it is like writing it's history with lightning. That's it. And, 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 and my only regret is that it is also terribly true. That was what he said about the pro clan movie, Birth of a Nation. And Wilson was a college uh, uh, president. He was a college roommate of the man who wrote it play that the movie was based on. Thank uh, you. Dixon. Thank you. Uh, it's a novel made into a very popular play. It was made into a play. play. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Well, wasn't, it the the first talk wasn't it the first talkie? Yeah. No. No, no, no. no, no. So it was Birth of a nation is a silent movie. It's 1915. Yeah. The first talkie is 1929. 27. Oh, okay. Uh, 27. Uh, first for uh, uh, Okay, the first talkie was the Joseph. jazz singer. No, the first talkie was the jazz talkie. Oh, really? Yeah. Like it was first or something like that. Okay, all right, one more time. All right, one more at a time. Okay, oh, ma'am, did you have a question? I had two questions. One was, how did the decline curve look from five million to today? Yeah, interestingly, um, that peak that happened when that tremendous march went down in Washington was the peak at five million. Uh, by the end of the decade, it sounded like 30,000. 
it fell off dramatically, partially because of D.C. Stevenson, because of the horrible scandals of his scandal, plus many others that were financial scandals by the leaders of the Klan. Um, so precipitous fall off after 1925. All right. Um, all right. Uh, Dave, did, uh, you, did, did, you, did I get, call on you already or no? No. No, okay, go ahead, Dave. I found your survey of the early history of the Klan very interesting. Would it be true to say today that the leaders of the United States, the financial political leaders of the United States, are very embarrassed by uh, by the racism of the subject. After all, this country is both economic and uh, political ties the emerging and the nations of Africa, Asia, and India, and Pakistan in particular. So they can't afford to have this uh, racism at home. Then why do we have it? Well, I think Ferguson uh, is one of those flashpoints again that shows you that there's still lots of problems. Uh, one thing, if you study history long enough, is that it repeats itself, and things like bigotry, bias, and hate really never go away. It's always in society somewhere. We're hopefully getting better at it, but there's still a lot of lingering. In America. I know. I understand that the the tip of the iceberg, you know, about the Story, but that's the type of thing that caused great embarrassment to yeah, they, Americans. They, yeah, they, they uh, can't just do it. All right, David. This is you can give you can talk about this in the rebuttal period. We've got other people who want to ask questions. All right, uh, Dan, go ahead. Okay. Um, there's a movie. What's the movie with Dustin Hoffman? And he's a dumb. Silent guy walking around. Uh, Rayman. Rayman. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> the other one. Little one. Big Man. <laughs> All right, Rayman. Rayman. At, at the beginning. At the beginning. Rayman. There's a be at the beginning. There's a picture of the clan starting. And it's uh, it's like rerunning of a Birth of a Nation, I think. I mean, it's like a cute so little thing the thrown into the yeah, movie okay. for no reason. I so, that. do you see things like that coming up every once in a while, even though the clan is so weak? Did you mean Forrest Gump? Well, Forrest, Forrest Gump. That's it. Forrest oh, Gump. Was Forrest Gump was Tom Hanks. Right. What's uh, yeah. the question? Mark. Forrest Tom Hanks. And, uh, he was named you know, Forrest after Nathaniel Bedford Forrest. Yes, he was named Nathan Forrest. Bedford Forrest. Nathan Bedford Forrest, who was the. Uh, Confederate general who became the first imperial lizard of the planet. So, is yeah. that, so that was historical. Yes. In fact, the man who wrote that is Winston Groom, who was a tremendous historian, who wrote Forrest Gump. He's got a new book out right now. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, Charlie, did you have a question? Yes. Uh, Dale, do you, maybe it's out of your time frame, but was membership in the, in the clan? Okay, go ahead, Charlie. Was membership in the clan? Fostered by the anti commie hysteria, fostered by Joe McCarthy? In 1915? Well, wait, 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 one fool at a time. I think that there is a resurgence in the Klan. It nearly dies, like I said, in 1925. The resurgence happens with the Civil Rights Act and the Civil Rights Movement uh, because the South, you know, it happens in the South primarily. Um, so, no, I don't think that the that the McCarthy hearings, I don't think there was, uh, this, this next one was inspired anything by uh, anti-socialism. This was because, you know, the federal government finally was going to do what it should have done in the South and try to, uh, you know, make the laws apply. Because you had Plessy versus Ferguson, 
1898, which allowed separate but equal, even though it never was. Uh, and then it was Brown versus Board in 54 that said it can't be done anymore. And that kicks off the civil rights movement and the Klan resurgence. And I saw an incredible documentary in WTTW about the Freedom Riders. And there is some film uh, of groups in, in Birmingham, Montgomery attacking those buses, and there are Klansmen in there, and it's scary as hell. Brown Baskins of Freedom Riders. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Uh, sir, did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned fraternal groups, yes. and you mentioned Woodland of the World, a yes. little tangent. Is there a tie-in to the Bohemian community? I was at Bohemian National Cemetery, and I swear I saw, like, monuments there that had that placard carved in or molded in, Woodsmen of the World. Do you know of that, or any, not in your... I'm not, um, I'm not sure who, um, who their clientele was specifically. Um, a lot of the early fraternal societies were nationalistic. You know, there are two huge Polish ones. If you go down the Edens, you'll see on the east side the Polish Alliance and the... Oh, <laughs> There's two of them. They almost have the buildings next to each other. They are enormous fraternal societies. And when Polish people moved to this country, that's where they got their insurance. That's where they had their meetings. That's where they could all congregate. And, and there were Sons of Italy. There were all kinds of fraternal societies that were that were uh, appealed to ethnic groups because they needed to come to America and feel like you know a brotherhood. Okay. Um, but the Moose Club also okay. was yes. yeah. Yeah. insurance. Yeah. All right. Moose many of them were many of them were insurance. Yes. All right. All right. It looks like we got time. Is there anybody else who has a question who has not already asked a question? Uh, no. Okay. Well, we have time for a second round of questions. So, uh, Tim. Uh, actually, Dave, you had your hand up first. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, you take checks. Sure. <laughs> All right. Good question. Yes. Is he good for it? <laughs> okay. Yeah, he's going up for 100 years. Yeah, All right. Uh, Tim, go ahead. Okay. I'd like to know. Um, I remember reading a book by Larry Ty about a gentleman by the name of Edward Bernays, who was the father of modern public relations. Have you heard of him before? And if you have, can you comment, please? You know, it's been. A little bit of time since I've reread my book, but I do uh, a short segment in there about the history of early public relations. There's the Creel uh, Committee during World War One. There's a guy named uh, I.D. Lee, uh, and that man, I think, there's a man with a last name started with B. And yeah. it could it could be the one I'd have to look it up. But he, he was a relative of Sigmund Freud. Okay. Oh, okay. All right, uh, Brom, you had your hand up. Did you have a question? Um, no, I haven't announced the right for Okay, you can okay. do that in the rebuttal time. Uh, Car okay, Carino, did you have a question? I was in Seville, Spain during Easter, and the Catholics were contrite, and they wore what really was a Ku Klux Klan outfit, except <laughs> it was blue. Yeah. And then af once after Good Friday, it was white because they were cleansed of their sins. Do you know the origins of, of the whole Klan outfit, or that... Not really. I have to tell you a funny thing. The other day, my wife and I were downtown. It was actually during Lollapalooza, and it was raining a bit on uh, Michigan Avenue. And we were standing under a canopy, and one of those double-decker tour buses came by, and there were a lot of tourists on the top part where there was no cover, and they had handed out ponchos, which looked, and they were white. And I said to my wife, "There's a sign convention in town. <laughs> Unbelievable! Uh, it was a pointy top and the whole thing." <laughs> okay, uh, but I could I could talk a little bit about that. The um, I, I'm not sure how the the classic one evolved, but uh, I talk about something called the Mary Fagan and the Leo Frank story uh, happened in 1914. You you should write my book. You know all this stuff. Um, and. Uh, the people, this, Leo Frank was a, a Jewish uh, manager of a factory in, in, in Atlanta, and this little 14 year old girl who was working there came to get her paycheck one day, which was brutally raped and murdered. They accused Leo Frank. Uh, he was Northern and Jewish, so he wasn't very well liked down there, and uh, they assumed he was guilty. He was found to be guilty. Uh, the governor stayed his execution and put him in a prison farm. But, a bunch of guys from the little girl's hometown of Marietta drove across the state in the middle of the night, took them out of jail, took them back to Marietta, and hung them. Those men were wearing masks, and they, many of them, became some of those early recruits to Simmons, uh, uh, like a, less than a year later on Stone Mountain. But I've seen they were kind of rudimentary-looking 
So yeah. I can't answer exactly well, who designed, okay. but obviously the Catholic Church monks, they've been wearing that stuff forever. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, I happen, okay, the, the type of uniform that they wore in the 20th century is based on the ones that the Reconstruction Era plan wore in the 19th century. Uh, they wore outfits that were similar. They varied from one from one clan group to another, but they had the same basic look. They they wanted to look like ghosts, like you said, right. ghosts of Confederate soldiers. Simmons fashioned it uh, because his father had been in the original plan, so he did. I okay. Try to follow All right, that. Rob, do you have a question? Yes, I do have a question. Did the clan uh, nationally ever develop a, uh, a legislative agenda? Well, I don't think they ever got strong enough nationally, but um, their agenda would have been all the things we hear about now. They would have been anti-immigrant, they would have been anti-foreign, anti-anything, mm. but what the mainstream Protestants would have wanted. I don't know if that's a good answer to that or not. There were a, a number of members of Congress who were Klansmen. In fact, there are a couple of famous names. It was Felix Frankfurter and Richard Byrd, I think, very early Richard, in their lives. No, Richard Black. 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 Uh, Black. Black. Uh, Black. Frankfurter was Jewish. Yeah, Frank oh, it's the Hugo Black? Black. Klan wouldn't have had him. Okay, but Richard Byrd, I think, early yeah. in his life was. Burr. Robert Byrd, the one who just retired? Yes. From West Virginia? He died. Okay, yeah, he was early, very early. Yeah. Yeah, he was, yeah, Richard, yeah, yeah he was actually, um, I believe he was Grand Cyclops, a uh, local group leader. So, uh, that's, that was back in the 40s. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, okay, Mike, did you have a question? Yeah, what was the uh, end game of the KKK? I mean, was it genocide? Was it they wanted people to get on the boat and go back to where they came from? Did they just wanted to be domestic terrorists? Is, what was the, what <laughs> I think that was it, just to be domestic terrorism, terrorists, kind of like uh, ISIL or, of America. Well, I think I think what? they wanted to to be so in control through terror or whatever else they could do that that their life. I say I talk about white Protestants here. I think white Protestants were afraid they were losing mm -hmm. their legacy in America. I mean, they're the ones that came over on Mayflower. And, so they were just a bunch of yahoos being terrorists. Well, yeah, but they were also in the 20s becoming, there were a lot of educated guys who were getting elected to Congress, and, and they had judges, and they were really trying to build, they called it an, an invisible empire that they were planning for at some point when they reached all their goals. And that empire you know, and they called it would really control life. All right. Uh, well, Ma'am, did you have a question? Was there any pattern of resistance to the Klan over the years? Could you repeat that, please? Well, it, uh, well it, the question it, is, was there any pattern of resistance to the Klan over the years? Okay. Well, not much in the South after Reconstruction, because it was really a method uh, for the majority to kind of keep the minority in tow. I think during Reconstruction, the U.S. Army uh, tried to police it. Uh, I think during the Civil Rights era, uh, <laughs> uh, John Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy and others started to try to control it as, you know, through the Constitution and, and the laws. What about the White Citizens' Councils? That was not a source of resistance. The white citizens. They were, yes. Okay, they were, I'm not all for okay wait, hold on. I can. I, if, do you mind if I? No. All right, I'll just tell everybody what the White Citizens Council was. Speech. That was an anti civil rights organization that existed mostly in the South during the civil rights era in the 50s and 60s. It was often just known as the Citizens Council. Uh, they, um, they were not the same thing as the KKK, and they were anti civil rights. They wanted to maintain. They wanted to maintain segregation. They were not the same thing as the KKK, but there was an overlap. Um, in general, well, the, well, the KKK members tended to be more working class. The Citizens Councils tended to be more <coughs> often business owners. Um, one guy that was, generally they didn't engage in terrorism, although a few individuals did, but they didn't as a group. There was one White Citizens Council member who did engage in terrorism, that's Byron Della Beckwith who assassinated the Mississippi head of the NAACP, Medgar Evers, in 1964. Um, 63. 63. Excuse, thank you, David. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. So, so that is um, 
Now, the group has actually been revived and exists today uh, with a slightly different name. It's now called the Conservative Citizens Council, or CCC. Uh, and and they have the same goals and the same general agenda. Of uh, Their goal is uh, white Christian supremacy for the United States. Um, now, the former Senator Trent Lott uh, was not a formal member, but he was an associate, a fellow traveler, if you will. And so was the former Virginia Senator George Allen, who lost his bid for re-election in 2006 because of his involvement with that. Well, it also got out as an anti, as being kind of anti. Well, he was he was weird. He's he's simultaneously George Allen is simultaneously anti-Jewish and Jewish at the same time, which is very strange. That's that, that's a whole other story. Lecture. Okay, but anyway, the group exists today, and they're they're bigger than the class. Well, thank you. Academic response to this book, or will it be on college campuses? It will be. I, I, I think I'm between at Michigan State and at Iowa, and maybe at Medilla Northwestern. But yeah, a, a few professors have read it. It's new scholarship for a lot of people. Uh, actually, I guess I'm boasting a bit, but the man, if you watch History Channel, and you, there are programs about the Klan, you see a spokesman from the Southern Poverty Law Center, the guy is Mark Podak, and he read it and gave me a really wonderful endorsement back here. He said to me on the phone one day, he said, I, you know, I really didn't want to read this book right away because I didn't think it was going to tell me anything I didn't know. And he said, I read it and I learned stuff I've never heard before. So I think academics are, are going to include it in a lot of histories. And, and it's not just um, civil rights history. Uh, I really talk about it as a book on the early, 19th history, early 20th century histories of marketing, PR, and journalism because there's a ton of that in here. Oh, okay, sir, did you have a question? Can you just uh, give a definition? What the hell is the Grand Wizard? Is it? The Wizard? Grand Wizard? Oh, the, the, the Imperial, 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 Imperial Wizard. Or Grand Lizard. Yeah, what's the hierarchy? The Imperial Wizard is the head of the clan. But that's what Bedford Forrest was, that's what Simmons was, that's what Evans was. Those are the first three. Okay, uh, Dan, did you have a Anyone question? Yeah, I have another question. Sure. Is this the first? Oh yeah. Oh, not history of the clan. There are tons of those. Yeah. And in, in fact, that's why, kind of, why in my intro I say this is not a clan book. Many books have written, been written about you know, the, the bad things the clan have done, and um, but this is really a book about these two people and selling of the clan. It's a different. All right, Dave. Did you have a question? Yes. Uh, I happen to have a copy of the. Uh, yes. Of the uh, uh, K for the Venetians. Huh? And the message of that seems to be that the, uh, uh, that the Klan came about as an answer to uh, the, re the, the government's reconstructionist vote. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, yes and, and the, the book portrays the people that come down, the, the whites who come down from the north to run, and <coughs> blacks who have, be, you know, are being given much more freedom as being really bad people. The real villains of the story uh, are uh, a man portraying Betty Stevenson, who is the reconstructionist. Betty yeah, Stevenson. Stevens. Stevens. Boy. Yeah. Um, he is in the, he's in the movie. And then, uh, members of the Reconstructionist government are, are painted in a bad way. Now, I have to defend D.W. Griffith. I have a master's in film, and this is one of the, the groundbreaking films of all times in terms of what he did compared to what had ever been done before in film. It's a brilliant film, it's just kind of a bad subject matter. Didn't one of the reasons he did it is he wanted to do a grand, long-form scale movie, and he wanted to portray Civil War battles, and he did that. The first part of it has Civil War battles and all of it. So, but he, he had techniques that had never been done before and are absolutely brilliant. So, But he was a southerner. His father had been a Confederate officer. He's from Kentucky. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have any? Yes, Joe. Would you tell us more about the, the current situation in the Klan? Um, I don't think there is much of a current situation. I think they're a very small group that really doesn't affect very much. Um, I told you about the, the, the little sandwich baggy messages. <laughs> I thought I heard that same thing happening in the Chicago area within the last year and a half in like a southwestern suburb. Same thing. 
people just notice these little messages. I hear, I see somebody nodding ahead. I think it did. People just found on the driveways a message, you know, that kind of stuff. I think Tinley Park, you know. It might have been that area. Somewhere, like what yeah. you said. It, yeah, so, I mean, they're, they're around, but they're pretty benign. Uh, you don't hear much in the news about them. Sure. I worked at a TV station in Columbus, Ohio, back in the 70s. And they held a rally on the steps of the Ohio uh, State Capitol. And uh, we had one of our TV cameramen covering it. And you see his video, and a fight broke out, and he got hit by something. And, and uh, he was knocked out, and there was a fight on the steps of Ohio. But that's an unusual one. Wow, what, what, when was when did this happen? In the 70s. In oh, Columbus. I think I've seen that video. It. You did that? I, I went, no, my station did. I, you our yeah. cameraman was there, oh, and he's yeah, the one I've seen the video. I think I saw that. Yeah. Okay, uh, okay, uh, Brom, you yes, have another uh, question. Is there any overlap with the uh, Dominionist uh, movement uh, in uh, Pentecostal and uh, 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 other? Uh, yeah, um, religious connections? Churches. I haven't really thought about this question, but I think a lot of the far right um, Protestant church, the super conservative groups, might have some feelings like the Klan have. I mean, they're, I think that they're so far right, um, some of the evangelical churches, that uh, I don't think. I haven't really thought about a religious element to it all. Of course, there was a religious element to the this point I'm talking about. Yeah. They they were raising the standard of Christianity and, and uh, good for them. All right, <laughs> Charlie, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, Dale, did the No Nothing group give the clan a little rivalry or? That's in my book too. <laughs> <laughs> the No Nothings are in my book. The No Nothings preceded the clan. Okay. I talk about. I talk about them in, in uh, terms of anti-Catholicism. I talk about the history of anti-Catholicism in America, and the Know-Nothings and the American Protective Society and others are all in there. Uh, all right. I talk about riots in New York City and in Philadelphia in the 1700s, 1800s, Louisville, Kentucky. Anti-Catholicism was uh, really severe huh. until a tremendous number of immigrants come, and it kind of balances Catholics out a little bit. But Early America, you know, there were probably less than 10% Catholics in early America. Um, almost exclusive, and, and the, the Protestants that came to America were escaping um, Catholicism in Europe. They, they were Puritans. They wanted to be pure of anything Catholic. Uh, so they're here, and then when Catholics come, they are really anti-Catholic. And they feel that they can't be Americans because they're not really loyal to the president. They're loyal to the Pope. Okay, I got a question. Okay, Karina, did you have a question? Uh, I had two quick questions. Number one, can a Klansman be a Mason? Um. Maybe, I don't know. I, you know. I've never been a member of any society, and the Masons are kind of a thing on their own. I mean, I'm, they're a fascinating group. I don't know if they would allow anybody in or not. Uh, the other question was, uh, sometimes I have seen of the flyer, it's a contour drawing of a Klansman, and it's put in ghettos, and um, I applaud what you guys are doing. Go ahead and kill each other. Um, you're doing exactly everything according to my plan. Um, have, do you know anything about the origin of those flyers? I don't. Um, interesting, you know, maybe this connects to that or not. It's an interesting fact that I didn't put it in my book. There's a period of time when Edward, of this pair, Edward Clark, is actually running the clan. Part of the deal in his contract is he became like the number two or three guy in the clan. Well, they get rid of Simmons because they can tr completely control him, and he takes over. During this period of time, he gets a visit at Imperial uh, headquarters from Marcus Garvey. Oh, wow. Who was a guy who really wanted separate separation of the races, even to go back to Africa. And the account is that they actually kind of admired each other because they were both had the same thought. And that's a separation of the races. So okay. They have two great leaders. All, all right. Yes, yes, I agree about that too. Um, all right. Um, all right. Dan, you have another question? Another question. Okay. I okay. actually, well, I know something about uh, there was a Jewish Zionist who went to see Hitler's 
representative in Berlin in 1930. So it's similar to Garaby talking to the Klan. Yeah. Okay. Um, you have a question? So is there anybody else like that, uh, very extremist separatist, who went to see the Klan? That you know, Muhammad Ali used to speak at Klan rallies. He did. Yes. I don't, I don't know of any other in my in, in the, the realm of this book. I don't. Yeah. All right. Because uh, Muslims support the separation of the races. Um, all right. Uh, Ram's all right. got one more, have, I think. All right. Anybody? Have, well, did yeah. anybody else have a question? Rob? Yeah. In the 1930s, the Kaufmanists mm -hmm. and uh, Father Kaufman and, uh, and uh, there were a number of of national groups, uh, of both German and Italian, uh, who uh, were, for that matter, other nationalities as well, uh, who were more or less supportive of fascism uh, and, uh, and Hitler, uh, Horthy and Hungary and so on, in this country. And I wonder how they related uh, to this uh, uh, anti-Catholic uh, Protestant uh, right. Uh, was there an overlap, uh, any sort of ecumenical, uh, uh, or, or uh, it seems like the KKK was a, a low common denominator as far as any principles went. Uh, yeah, I don't know if any of them line themselves with the Ku Klux Klan, but I think there have been some leaders in America who have surprised us by their ideology, and I think of uh, Lindbergh and Henry Ford as the ones who were pre World War II were kind of supportive of what was going on in Germany. All right, sir, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, how did you arrive at that title? Can you explain that title? Oh, I can absolutely explain the title. And I'd like to buy your book. Zero. I'll give you the book and then I'll explain the title. Me too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have to tell you, I was actually in, in sitting in a Catholic mass, and if uh, those of you who are Catholic are aware of the Lord's Prayer, the priest gives. You do the Lord's Prayer, the priest speaks a couple of sentences, and then at the end it says, For the kingdom and the power and the glory of yours, forever, amen. Um, so I hate that, I'm not feeling too guilty, but I borrowed that because um, for the kingdom and the power, I thought that these people did it for the kingdom, and that's a capital K. And they definitely did it for the power, because power equates to money, and they gained a lot of power. So I thought the title worked really well. I hope I haven't offended anybody because of it. It is like, it is, if you take the four off, it's a book done by Gay Talese about the history of the New York Times about 45 years ago called The Kingdom of the Power. Yeah. So I couldn't use that when I had to put a preposition. Okay, no, but Lori, was, were you, that, if I may ask a follow-up question, <laughs> yes, is, is, in that title, were you alluding to the clan, to the KKK's religiosity? No, I, this, is, this is Edward and Bessie, they did it for the kingdom. Oh, okay, okay. All right. Um, Bill, right. did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, about 10 years ago, a book came out about the great New York draft riots. And, uh, New York draft riots, okay. I've seen an account uh, uh, witnessing those riots, that it was not about the draft enlisting. So the slaves wouldn't uh, be freed and Take these uh, poor people's uh, jobs. What year would this have been? The Civil 63. War. 63. What, it, what it's talking about? About 1863. Oh, oh there were, yeah, absolutely there were New York draft riots. At, yeah, Civil War draft riots. And I think you are probably right in what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. I have not read the book, but All right. that, that, that happened. All right, uh, listen, last uh, question. Jim, did you have a question? Or? Yes, okay. uh, and I hope it'll be the last one because we have to get the rebuttals. Yeah. I just want to ask you, the book's just been published. You're now on tour with the book and you're pu publicizing it. What might be your next project or have you considered it yet? I have a book in mind. 
None of you steal it now, because then it's here. <laughs> it has to do with the Philippines insurrection, ah, which oh, is 1899 to 1902. Uh, yeah. It's like Vietnam, Vietnam 60 years before Vietnam. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a war that history books, I'm a history teacher, so I know that history books cover the Spanish-American War and they jump to World War One. And this thing was much bigger than the Spanish-American War, much longer, much more brutal. Really? Um, and there's an interesting court-martial of a Marine general that I'm talking about. I've never, never heard of it. You never heard of that no. war, Jerry? Um, I may have, but... Three, seriously. They, still, they kept fighting Moro tribesmen for a few more years. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, all right. Now, we're going to have... All right. Yeah, one gentleman. Uh, sir, you had a question? He's going to go ask you. I'll do that. Okay. All right. Let's have a, let's, let's have a warm round of applause for our speaker. Okay, now first of all, now first of all, so let's, we'll get into the rebuttal. First of all, I want, how many people want to speak? I want to show of hands. Okay, keep your hands up, people. Okay, that's uh, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, what are you, Brown? Uh, Steve? Okay, uh, okay, all right, six, seven, eight, nine, 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 nine. Uh, Okay, I count nine people plus the speaker, that's ten. All right, so Go uh, down that's going to be um, roughly four to five minutes. Yeah, I would say, uh, how about, yeah, uh, how about uh, five minutes? Yes. Okay. Okay, five, five minutes each. And uh, all right, uh, here's, here's Gene. What about you too, Ron? Okay. Uh, okay, well, uh, thank the speaker. Obviously, I thought he was pretty good. I bought his book. So, <laughs> it was a really good story. I, uh, very, very interesting. Uh, I want to mention two books that re uh, respond to this a little bit. One is Why America Failed by Morris Berman. And it's about the idea that we Americans, not necessarily me, <coughs> people here, but in general, we're a bunch of hustlers. We're always trying to make something, and here he's talking about uh, two people who decide to make a lot of money at everyone else's expense. That's as American as apple pie. Uh, not the kind of America I want, but it's the kind of America. And another kind of America is uh, the book he mentioned by James Lowen. Uh, uh, Lies my, teacher Lies, my teacher told me. Lies my teacher told me, I'm sorry. They, I think he rewrote it about, I think he revised it uh, recently. But I made a summary of the book. I'll try to remember, remember to bring a couple copies of it. And it's the idea that uh, if you read American history, boy, you better read more than one book. Because it's, uh, it's full of lies. Uh, you know, the stuff you heard in history uh, at, at the high school level where most of us find our, our U.S. history. A lot of it is, say, the nicest thing would be celebratory. Uh, he says lies, and a lot of it were, uh, was lies, and I, I would certainly uh, read that book by James Lowen because it's well worth it. And what can you do to get around all of that? Well, one thing you can do is read a lot of history books. Because when you read one or two or three or four books, some of them that I've read have been recommended by people right here, uh, you get an idea of you can look from one book to another and compare. And of course, the other thing you can do is be a uh, student like I am at the College of Complexes. You learn a lot of stuff. Thank you. There's a preacher gets up on the pulpit down south and uh, says, uh, there's been stories going around, I've been working with the cluckers, and I want to know where these stories got started. And his wife says, well, I only said you were a wizard under the sheets. Well, 
Uh, take it easy, bro. <laughs> I used to know sort of a client fellow traveler. Uh, he said all kinds of outrageously bigot bigoted things. And uh, he was all bark and no bite. He did bark a lot, but he did uh, never bought the bite bit that I know of. Uh, but anyway, he'd say things like, uh, this pollution control stuff on cars was just a lot of garbage. And I saw a footnote in a book about uh, uh, racist labor unions in the 19th century that blacks enjoyed scabbing on whites. So it was kind of macho. And I'm collecting, e I'm still collecting email addresses. Uh, I think a lot of these things have, uh, these tensions have economic solutions. And you have to know the difference between a real free market and a purported free market. Uh, oh, and I heard stories in Terre Haute about 50 years ago that uh, some black guy was castrated in Terre Haute by the claim. Charlie, our beloved organizer, uh, would like email addresses for all of you so that you can get notices of meetings and so on. And uh, I uh, don't know what other nefarious purposes he has, but this is the list for it. Uh, and uh, if you are not already on his email list, uh, I hope that you will add your uh, name and uh, address. Give us your email. It's on the table here. Okay. Our next speaker, please. I think um, in order to understand about the Klan, you have to go into, re into the Reconstruction period, right after the Civil War. Now, a lot of black people not only were slaves on the farms and the cotton fields, but a number of them were apprentices. For instance, some of them were apprentices to tailors, some were carpenters, some to uh, different other, other different crafts. And after the Civil War, a lot of them started, a number of them started to go into business by themselves. And they became middle class. Also, during the Reconstruction period, you had a number of whites that also collaborated with the newly freed blacks in order to form businesses, in order to form farms, plus the fact that a number of slaves, ex-slaves, uh, came into the Congress and came into the Senate. Now, if you look at during that period, of course, the landowners had most of the power, especially the plantation owners. So if you have all these people getting together, oh, there, there's a danger to the upper class, to the planters and the petty bourgeoisie in that particular era, there's a danger to them that some of their power would be taken away and the blacks would get equal wages with the whites. 
because they see them collaborating with one another. Well, that's when the Ku Klux Klan comes in. They had to have some way of curtailing that. And the best way of curtailing it is to install fear. So it started up the Klan. And they intimidated them, hung them, and coerced them quite a bit in order for the uh, plantation owners and the other petty bourgeois to come back into power. Now, uh, at a certain period, during the Reconstruction period, I guess you the uh, Northern Army had to leave because a lot of them went into the West to fight Indians. And so you had a, t a situation where the uh, upper classes in the South were put in a position where they could gain back power. And that's why the Ku Klux Klan was formed in order to do that. And after a while, you had a segregation, but on a different level, what they called Jim Crow, which we still have today, by the way. Even though people have gained some freedom and some power, the powers that be are using the army and the police in order to form a police state right now. Uh, there's going to be a lecture, I don't know what day it's going to be, uh, but uh, there's a, f a famous uh, uh, anti-war activist I can't think of her name, but her husband is Bill Ayers. Bernadette Dorn. Healy. Yeah, yeah Bernadette, Bernadette Dorn. Oh, and on. she's going to speak at the uh, yeah. Hartfield Cafe. Hart Heartland. 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 Heartland Cafe, but I don't know what date. And there's going to be some lawyers there, and they're going to talk about the CPT. Well, they're announcing it now. I heard it on the radio. And there's a danger right now that we're going into a police state. Oh, yeah. I think the beginning has already started. Like Hitler started very slowly, and you didn't actually know that what he was going to do. I think it's beginning right now. We're in the beginning of fascism in the United States. A very dangerous period. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who's next? First of all, I would like to thank our speaker for a very illuminating and interesting presentation. That's why I bought your book. Thank you. Sir. Um, the Klan was more powerful than most people I give it credit for. I've heard too many people say, well, Indiana was, it was fertile ground for the Klan because it was so southern or whatever, baloney. The Klan was at its height reached into places like Oregon and even onto Long Island. Um, in 1928, when Al Smith was nominated for the Democrat, to be the Democratic candidate for president, yeah, there were fiery crosses burning out in Long Island potato fields. At that time, Long Island was inhabited by three people, groups of people, mostly Protestants. The upper crusters who owned the huge estates, the people that, for lack of a better term, I'll call blue-collar Protestants, were mostly fishermen who lived in, lived in, the, in some of the villages on the coast, who worshipped in nice little white, white clapboard churches, and who didn't think any more of blacks, Jews, or Catholics than the upper crusters. And then you have the potato farmers. And none of these people had like Al Smith. And while the upper clusters were too well bred to join the Klan, uh, the potato farmers thought nothing about joining it. And I dare say some of the fisher folk did too. As for why uh, the troops left the South, uh, Reconstruction ended after Ulysses Grant left the White House in 1877 for this reason. There was a dispute over the counting of for whose electoral votes in, in certain southern states, including Louisiana, were going to be counted. And it went before Congress. It bogged down. A deal was cut between Rutherford, a 
behalf of Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican candidate, who promised that if he were elected, he would pull the troops out of the South and he would appoint a Southerner uh, who wound up being David Key to his cabinet. He got named Postmaster General. And um, under that, remember that cynical deal that cut Democrat Samuel Tilden out of the presidency, uh, that ended Reconstruction a bit prematurely, so some of us uh, might happen to think. Um, finally, um, you didn't talk that much about the anti-Semitism that, that, uh, that the Klan helped to foster. Uh, those big Jewish immigration, or I should say the big immigrations of the 19th century that brought large numbers of Catholics out of this country brought large numbers of Jews as well. Uh, most of us, most of my forebears were fleeing either pogroms uh, in, in, in Russia that were fomented by uh, the, the Tsar. And those who didn't flee because of that fled because of the Russian Revolution. And again, a lot of these people, uh, or I should say, a lot of the uh, Protestants in this country thought, well, these people are all socialists or communists or whatever. And, and because some of us look different with beards and black hats and whatnot, well, it was easy to look at us as aliens. <laughs> and as a result, the 1920s were one of the worst periods for anti-Semitism in this country. It was as blatantly expressed at that time as it has ever been. And there were restrictions on what clubs Jews could join, how many people could go to various universities and the professions and so on. And the Klan added these people to the list. Finally, in the 1970s, the Klan began to admit Catholics. Why? Well, because when all the protests about busing and open housing started, and they saw Catholics protesting this on TV, well, the Klan decided, well, these people must be all right after all. And they began to admit Catholics at that point. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I talked with a policeman in Bridgeport some years ago. Uh, I heard him talking to some other people, and he was talking about beating some people up that he had caught. That he took care of them and then brought them in, and I said to him I wanted to talk to him, and I told him, I said, don't you think that it's only your job to apprehend a, a suspect and bring him in rather than to be the judge, jury, and executioner? And he said, well, you don't understand. What if uh, some guy broke into your house, or what if some guy raped your sister? Uh, and you want us to give them the treatment? And I said, no. I said, what happens if you beat them up and then, uh, and then uh, a week or so later they find out that he was just happened to be walking through the alley and that he had nothing to do with it? I said, what do you do? Uh, go to him and say, gee, I'm awful sorry. Uh, I said, no, that, that doesn't work. And, and by the way, though, that man was in the same category as any KKK uh, because freedom is the only thing you must be willing to give to everyone else in order to have. Uh, it can never be freedom for white Anglo-Saxon Americans, but not for the Jews, or except for the Polacks, or except for the Italians, or except for the Germans. Everyone is entitled to the same freedom, or there can't be any freedom. You know, it wasn't too long ago I heard a, uh, uh, some politician wanted to cancel constitutional rights for drug dealers that were arrested. Now, that wasn't too long ago. And one guy spoke up and said, if the worst drug dealer has no constitutional rights, then none of us do. 
It, uh, somebody said, well, the KKK isn't very big today, so it's, you know, it's negligible. But it does not matter how small the KKK or any other hate group is. It, it only takes one man to pull a trigger. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald or James Earl Ray or that guy that uh, uh, influenced the, the uh, fanatic that killed that guy Birdsong that went out on a shooting spree. Ben Smith. I'm sorry? That was Ben Smith who killed Ricky Birdsong. And the guy that influenced him? Oh, gosh, that was good. Matthew Hale. Yeah, yeah and he, he, Matthew Hale was sent to prison. Uh, but the point is that as long as there are people out there who are full of hate or who are inspiring hate, then it doesn't matter if they say, well, I'm doing it for Christ, or I'm doing it for the KKK, or I'm doing it for whatever, there, it's it's not to call for. It's un-American. And if you if you don't want to grant freedom or the same rights to every other group in this country, then you it amounts to not granting rights to anybody. Uh, I just want. I'm not finished. <laughs> uh, I wanted to say that in ancient times, uh, hate was the order of the day. One man said no. Love is the answer. He was beheaded. Today, they are all forgotten. But he is remembered. He was remembered so well that they made him a saint and called him Saint Valentine. Thank you. You know, it really is Bravo, interesting. Sure. It really is an well, interesting phenomenon and can. thing how our author I talked twice. about this mm -hmm. money-making scandal. Well, but you know, it's only course. been fairly been recently. Checked. For example, the uh, founder of MySpace, the social networking mm -hmm. site back in 2003, mm -hmm. has a similar story of a uh, monetary scandal and scams associated behind his name as well as many other so-called internet entrepreneurs. Um, the big thing, though, that I really wanted to bring up was that uh, this whole science of modern public relations was founded by a gentleman by the name of Edward Bernays, who was a relative of Sigmund Freud. And I think one of the most craziest things he did was in his widespread adoption of cigarette smoking for women. And he developed a... Uh, Edward Bernays had, was under contract with the uh, tobacco companies. And what did he do? In early New York, uh, the Easter parade, where the women and their people would get out of their synagogue, walk down Fifth Avenue in all their Syn fashions. Syn no. Syn I mean, well, you know, from the churches, the synagogues, but the Easter parade phenomenon was so big in New York that most people would walk down Fifth Avenue in their Easter best and was sort of a coming out of high society at that time. Well, what Edward Bernays did was he got about eight of the most gorgeous looking women in New York, paraded them down smoking cigarettes, and they made the cover of almost every women's magazine in the world, and that's what really started the phenomenon of women and smoking worldwide. Later on in his life, Edward Bernays also became, did a lot of work for the anti-smoking campaigns. The book that I learned this from is another one by the gentleman by the name of Larry Tide, it's called The Father of Spin. Very interesting. Again, I'd like to appreciate Mr. Lackman with, for his wonderful book, and uh, I'd like to give him another round of applause. Okay. Get up and do a rebuttal, dude. All right. Do a rebuttal. There's a, a number order. Well, you have to walk up and...
Just yeah. go, that's all. Just yeah, go. Just go. We want to hear what he gets. After yeah. graduate school, you have to get I, uh, up and went go. to work. One full at a time, y'all. Down in Huntsville, Alabama. It was in 1955. And uh, I got off the train down there and I got into the station. And there was two entrances, one for white and one for colored, and two water fountains. Um, the town of Huntsville, Alabama was hardcore southern. It was a dry county. There were no uh, liquor sales there. <clears throat> um, the town population was 15,000. But Huntsville, Alabama had the peculiarity. Um, the famous Nazi went to work there, Werner von Braun. And uh, because he did, they had to develop a whole cadre of scientists and engineers, which they did. Unfortunately, for those people in Huntsville, Alabama, the, the majority of the people who were brought in to work on these projects were Yankees. They were from the North. And they did not share the hardcore racism of the uh, people of uh, Huntsville, Alabama. They may have been racist, and many of them were, I'm sure. But nonetheless, in the five years that I worked there, things changed. The 15,000 people that were there when I came ended up to be 65,000 when I left five years later. And the majority of them were Yankees, the vast majority. And it changed the perspective of the town completely. It was no longer dry. Um, segregation ended in certain areas. Uh, and there was a a whole new attitude, which was alien to the people who lived in that town prior to 1956. And uh, it, it, it was in somewhat encouraging, but unfortunately it's regressed since then. Hi folks. Hey. Um, nice shirt. Uh, <laughs> what, what? Actually, this is a calm one for me. Yes, yeah. But when I first uh, moved to Atlanta, Georgia, I remember that uh, we went to Stone Mountain. My parents took me there for a picnic. Now you got to know that the guy who did the sculpture on Stone Mountain was Ku Klux Klan. He had also done the sculpture from Mount Rushmore, which was supposed to be a symbol of how the whites had destroyed the Indians. Um, so to me, the Ku Klux Klan is as American as apple pie, which is also the name of my photo album of things I've collected of the Klan. I have, for example, a women's Ku Klux Klan outfit. <laughs> All of the records that they put out in the 1960s against civil rights. Um, so I'm very well aware of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, but I think it's important to realize that the roots of America's left are in the Ku Klux Klan. Okay. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, 1915, sees birth of a nation. He says it's history written with lightning bolts. He's the founder of the progressive movement. 1915, the Ku Klux Klan takes off again after it's been dead for almost two decades, and the Ku Klux Klan allows black members. There's 20,000 blacks that join the KKK. Studs Terkel actually, in uh, his one of his books, uh, quotes from a preacher whose father was a member of the Klan. Now this sounds confusing, but keep in mind, if you wanted to know what the churches were saying, who was radical, who wasn't, what better way than to have one of the blacks working at the home be a member of the Klan reporting to you? Okay? We're not supposed to know about that. We're not supposed to know that happened. Now, Paul Robeson, 
goes to the FDR White House and he sits down and he says, President Roosevelt, you <laughs> must go along with the Republicans. <laughs> and FDR says, what? And he says, the Republicans have been against lynching for three decades. If you would just unite with the Republicans on this one issue, we could end lynching in the United States. And the security guards came and they picked Paul Robeson up by his arms, took him out to the front door, pushed him out of the White House. There is no American left without the Ku Klux Klan. If you're a woman, you can't own property. You can't open your own business. You can't vote. But guess what? What if you're a woman and you're in the KKK? You can open your own business. You can get loans from the bank. You can open your own account. Women in the Ku Klux Klan get more rights than all other women. Then you turn around and you go, well, I'm against booze. I don't think al alcohol should be available to people. Guess what? The Ku Klux Klan let their halls be used for the early suffragettes, for the prohibitionists. Now, why did they want the uh, suffragist movement to have a place to say women could vote. They were afraid blacks would get the vote and that they would eventually outnumber white men and the only way to stop them is to have women. Now we are taught by people like Chuck and the left, we are taught that the women's right to vote was for everybody. And we celebrate it every year. Guess what? Black women did not get the vote. The only reason white women did was they did not want to be outnumbered by blacks. Now, it gets even better. It gets even better. In the 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan out of Indiana, which was the biggest Klan, and was run by Republicans, by the way, not Democrats, um, the Ku Klux Klan began an anti-lynching campaign. They said, we have to stop lynching because the federal government may come down on us. And by the way, why should you lynch when our judges, our police, the people that are members of the jury are either all members of the Klan or support the Klan. Okay? Now, unions. Well, guess what? The Ku Klux Klan, Chuck, you'll be happy to hear this, did back unions that were all white and supported the unions that would not allow minorities to join, which was almost all of them in the 1920s and 30s. So, all I can say okay, is your time's up, to, your time's to understand up. the left in America, to understand why feminists want to burn Playboy, to understand uh, torture. Okay, to, I, I got a question for you, Mike. Yeah. Can, 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 we, can we, we have some understanding of when you'll quit talking so that the next person can speak? Next. All right. Okay. 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 change for the better or change for the worse, or they can stay the same. Now, a lot of stuff that we face as human, as a society, as 
uh, 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 entity that we call a government, uh, they could say the same. Now, somebody mentioned racism, and I think they referred to uh, Ferguson, Missouri, stuff like that. These are isolated incidents, and sometimes you sh shouldn't uh, mangle them with other things. For instance, my observation is the government is in charge, and the people that own the government <laughs> is in charge of the government. And two things that the government don't allow, and the people that own the government don't allow. Dick Tom and Harry running their business. Now, like David uh, Singer asked a question about, uh, 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 he made some remarks, he went and asked a question about uh, 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 the, 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 the people, business people, to say that well, we can't have this uh, racism anymore and so forth and so on. And he was into something. And he was into something because just like me, I'm living. So I can see what's happening. Now, if you think racism today is at the formal level it was in the 50s or the 60s, no way. The guy that run the world don't care how and who you are. And I don't know how much evidence do people need to, to believe that statement I just made. We got a black president. You think, uh, you, you think that somebody uh, went out and said, well, I mean the people, you think the people you, choose him, selected him? Give me a break, please. Mm -hmm. The people that run the world need the world. In that bullshit segregation and bullshit racism that they used to support, the government. For instance, they had laws that you rolled on the back of the bus. You couldn't do this, you couldn't do that, and so forth. That don't happen anymore. In fact, if you say something about black folks now, they take your base, uh, baseball team from you. So why are they doing that? Do they love black folks? No. They love power, they love money, and they will uh, uh, do whatever it takes to maintain that power, maintain that money. Now, you got individuals that going to be individuals that I call somebody just like me, burning a, burning a, 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 a cross on my lawn. Who is he? Just like me. He don't run a goddamn thing. He don't run the world. He don't run nothing. He my equal. He go and drive that truck like I do. Go to work at the post office or the police department just like I do. Who is he? He is a guy and the woman that's going to always be around. You're going to have that. But sensible people, when the government say, I don't have to ride on the black of the bus, what do I care about him? If the, if the uh, government say that, and the guy tries to say, well, you can sit in the same classroom and all the rest of the university as anybody else. Give me a break. I'm not going to fall for that little 1930 shit, the 1949, and so forth. Those days are gone. However, in the, uh, uh, don't get me wrong now. The guy in charge will take advantage of whatever uproar, whatever dysfunction, whatever's happening in the world and society, he will let that happen if that means that his power and his money is uh, uh, secure. So therefore, certain so things are going to be happening where this look like this, uh, uh, the Zunis fighting the Shiites or whatever it is, 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 is bad because they're killing one another. But guess what? Any type of uh, conf uh, stuff like that, including uh, Ferguson, Missouri, and so forth and so on, these things can happen, and when they happen, they benefit certain people. But guess guess what? It's not the people's in charge, and it's not my government anymore, because we don't have one. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Who, um, okay, who, all right, who else, who else wants to give a rebuttal speech? No? Oh, right. uh, all right. All right. All right. Oh, yeah. I got it right. All right. I'm going to go. All right. Well, there, is, anybody else wants to give a rebuttal speech? 
No? Oh, uh, Bill, you already had rebuttals. Yeah, I want to. Give him another one. No, no, no. Wait, wait, can only, only one, one person at a time. All right. All right. All right. Um, all right. If there isn't, everybody's already had it. Who wants their speech has already had one. I'll go ahead. Okay. Are you going to time me, Karina? Okay. Oh, wait. Mike, did you give a rebuttal speech already? Or did no. you want to give a rebuttal speech? Yeah. Okay, come on down. Go ahead. You go and I'll go after you. No, 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 you, no, after you. All right. Yeah. You're tired. Oh, I always give my, my moderator always gives oh, his second to last. Yeah. Sorry. You go first. Penultimate. Penultimate, yeah. You know, seeing a, seeing a movie, I, I looked it up on my Google search. The um, Birth of the Nation was the first movie ever shown in the White House. That was, that was uh, one of the And um, seeing a movie is like lightning bolts. Sounds like, well, if you know what a neutral statement is, it's neither not positive or negative. It's like when George Bush famously said, we're addicted to oil. Okay, is that positive or negative? It's a neutral statement. So, you know, I'm not, a, you know, there's nothing to be made of it. It's not a stand. It's kind of wimpy. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, All right. Uh, I'll be real you quick, uh, you come on up here. Let's give our speaker a round of applause. Yeah, right here. Very nice, very nice historical uh, contribution here to the body of literature. I just wanted to say, actually, I, I follow the, the hate groups, and I know about Clan Watch, and um, there isn't a lot, though. They, they kind of don't like an internet presence. So it's a little hard to find out what they're up to, but um, they seem to have a base in uh, weaponry and guns and things like that. The only thing I, I'd like to say is, though, there's, and Don, you've spoken about this at the college, we have a commonly accepted concepts in political discussion, and there's right wing and left wing. And I've always, kind of, like when I came here tonight, always believed that if you had an organization with the principles of the KKK, it would be clearly classified without dispute by anyone to be a right-wing organization. However, I apparently have stand to be corrected. <laughs> 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 it is, in fact, a progressive leftist organization, oh at God. least according to my dear friend Mike, which I, I'm going to have to think about for the next few days. But thank you, sir, again. <laughs> All right. Just, there were four more Democrats in the plan than there were Republicans. What's the real history? All right. Um, all right. All right. Any, all right. Anybody else wish to give a rebuttal speech at, uh, this time? Who is, and this who has not already given a rebuttal speech? Um, no. All right. Well, I'm going to give a rebuttal speech real quick. Uh, first of all, all right. Uh, now, Tim, are you timing me? Yes. Okay. Now, for, first of all, I would like to thank our speaker again for for, uh, uh, for coming tonight. This was a really uh, this was a really enlightening presentation. This is, as I've mentioned, I've studied the Klan in the past, and so this is a subject that's of great interest to me. To me. Um, I, uh, I read a really good book on the Klan uh, some years ago. It's, I don't know if it's still in print now. It's called The Fiery Cross by Win Craig Wade. It's about the history of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, yeah, okay, so you can still get it in the library, even if it's out of print. Now, um, what, what really interested me was what, what you described tonight was the Ku Klux Klan as a multi-level marketing organization. <laughs> now, in other words, that the Klan was the racist analog to Amway. You know, so that was something that the organizational structure that you described was that of, of an MLM. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Amway and multiple marketing, but that's how it operates. You get people who go out, they're sales reps, and they try to recruit other people into their downline organization, uh, and, and those people try to recruit others, and then they, they and, and then, 
this is single level. That oh, oh. They didn't report uh, as additional. Oh, oh, okay. So it's not multi level. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay. I stand corrected. So, okay, so it's not a pyramid structure, but still, but still, you said that they get, they would get a, that as with Amway, when you recruit people, you get a kickback, you get a percentage of their dues, and then a percentage of their dues goes to the national, right? Okay, that is, that is how Amway operates. Uh, I used to work for a multi-level marketing organization, a yeah. multi-level marketing company, so I have first-hand experience with this. Now, so, in gen so I thought this was very enlightening, a, a di different take on the KKK. Um, I would just make a few little corrections. First off, you mentioned the civil rights movement starting in 1954 after Brown versus the board. Actually, the civil rights movement existed long before 1954. Um, as a matter of fact, the civil rights movement was started by the same people that started the abolition movement. Um, well, or at least it was abolitionists before slavery had even been abolished that started civil rights. For example, Frederick Douglass' campaign for civil rights. Um, the, end of the Brown versus the board itself came about as a result of a suit brought by the NAACP. Uh, the lawyer and, and, and that organization was founded I believe, in the 1900s, I believe. What, do you know what the date is, David? 1909. 1909, there you go. Okay. Now, second, um, about D.W. Griffith. Um, D.W. Griffith was a good filmmaker, I would agree, at least in the sense that he was competent and innovative and artistic. Uh, but then uh, you could say the same thing about Lenny Riefenstahl. But uh, she was. Okay, well, there you go. And, and for those of you who don't know, Lenny Riefenstahl uh, did documentary films for the Nazis. And, and they actually were very uh, innovative and had an impact on future documentary filmmaking. Uh, now, uh, one other correction I would make is that the Puritans who came, who came to New England were not escaping from Roman Catholicism. They were actually escaping from the Church of England, which didn't approve of their brand of Protestantism. Uh, not, not Roman Catholicism. Oh, okay, no, but but that's yeah, but yet, you see, calling the Church of England Catholic, that was that was what the, the Puritans used to do, uh, saying they're the same thing as Catholics. And I I still, it, I'm from the South. By the way, I'm from Tennessee, birthplace of the Ku Klux Klan, and, and I still meet I, I meet people down there who say who who think the Episcopals are the same thing as the Catholics. Um, but in any case, they weren't escaping from Roman Catholicism. They were trying to escape from the from the Church of England. Now, uh, somebody, okay, Tim mentioned, um, I think it was you, Tim, who you mentioned people coming out of, coming out of the synagogue to, to see the Easter parade. I, I don't really imagine a whole lot of synagogue goers observing Easter, but I don't know, maybe, maybe I haven't lived in New York. Maybe a mistake. Oh, okay, okay, so I stand corrected on that. All right, now, all right, now, um, uh, now, somebody else mentioned, I think, okay, Mike, uh, Mike Lehman mentioned uh, George W. Bush saying we're addicted to oil and saying that's a neutral statement. It isn't because, uh, because you are, uh, by just saying, using the term addiction, that's not the only way to put it, but by using the term addiction, you're comparing our use of oil uh, with drug addiction, which most people would agree is a negative, because it sounds like, you know, you're using something that's bad for you and you can't get off it. I'm not saying I disagree with George Bush, I'm just pointing out that that's not a neutral statement. It's, it's a judgment on, on our use of oil. Yeah. Now, now I would like to talk about, uh, about Mr. Flores yeah. and his comments. So. First of all, he calls Woodrow Wilson the founder of the progressive movement. Yeah. Uh, can Number I, five. Okay, can I, have, can, I just have, can I just have a little bit more time, uh, Tim? Okay. Only if I can read it. All right. Only if I can read it. No. One bullet. Well, then no. Okay, all right. First of all, Woodrow Wilson was not the founder of the progressive Never. movement. Never. Right. He's right. He was not. And, and uh, the, he ran against the progressive party candidate in 1912, Theodore Roosevelt. Yes. He was a Democrat. He was not a progressive. Second, um, second... I never, I don't know how many, I've never heard of the KKK admitting blacks before. That's a new one on me. Now, third, third, third. All right, one fool at a time, Mike. Okay, now. You won't let me rebut. So this is Wait a minute. the only I, way I can rebut. Let him finish. Let him finish. You're already breaking the rules. One fool at a time. One fool at a time, Mike. All right, now, second. Warren Harding was, um, uh, Warren Harding, uh, Republican president, is the only president to have been secretly sworn in as a member of the KKK, or openly for that matter, but it was secret. Now, four, about the feminists and, the, and about this notion that the feminists were anti-civil rights. 
Um, Frederick Douglass uh, was part of the feminist movement. He worked with Susan B. Anthony and campaigned for women's suffrage. Now, finally, uh, the Indiana KKK had both Democrats and Republicans in its ranks. And, um, and, and I also just want to say, if you believe anything else that Mike Flores said tonight, I've got a bridge in Brooklyn I'd like to sell you. And some oceanfront property okay. in Arizona. Don, <laughs> was the Klan in the AFL-CIO? I don't know, tell me, Jim. Yeah. That's bullying. Okay, okay, That's bullying. Yeah. If you don't allow, allow a... 1080. Let's get up there for a minute and oh, get right. rebuy. Give him a minute. Give him a minute and get yeah. up there and rebuy. Yeah. Yeah. Just so he knows, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> Hey. Well, you better give it to Susan. She just took off. All right. First off, the um, suffragist movement was a white women's movement. Okay, there were no black women that got the vote when white women got the vote. Are you listening? You made these comments. Now, are you listening to no, the white not. Vote? Great. I have a right not to listen. I'll listen to you, I'll listen to you Mike. You can pull the wool over your own eyes then. But the point is, anybody ever hear of a woman named Margaret Sanger? Anybody ever hear of Margaret Sanger with Planned Parenthood? No church would allow her to speak. So guess where she gave her speeches? at the Ku Klux Klan halls, and there's photographs. You can look up Margaret Sanger, KKK, and you will see photos of her speaking at Klan rallies and saying things like, blacks should be stopped from reproducing. There's a reason why when I lived in Bronzeville for a year, didn't I? Yes. Yes, I did. Yes. There's a reason the black Folks don't allow Planned Parenthood in their neighborhood and that they take government money and go to the schools and tell them to abstain from sex while they're pocketing all the cash. Whereas on the north side, where the white folks are, Here, Planned Parenthood goes thing. into the schools and gives out condoms. Yeah. Okay? Our, There's a reason, and the reason is Let's clear this thing. They right. know yes, that no. Margaret Sanger was a All right. All right. How much time? Good call. Now, we have Supreme Court judges. We have folks like Harry S. Truman, who dropped the bomb on an inferior race. The Japanese. Don't worry about it. Come I told him. Harry Truman was a Klansman. Okay. He was KKK. Now all I'm saying is, your time's up, Mike. Your time's up. The left is as dirty on this as the right is. All right. <laughs> Give the author the mic. Okay. Author gets the last okay. word. All right. Well, Mike is uh, Mike is enlightening as ever. <laughs> all right, all right. Now it's time for our, our speaker um, uh, to have to have the final word. Oh. Yay. <laughs> By the way, somebody just pulled up Ma hey, one fool at a time, Mike. Here. One fool at a time, Mike. There she is saying the black race should be wiped out. Hey, Planned Mike. Parenthood. Okay, Mike. Mike. The votes are right here. One person. Mike. All right, pull it time. Don't take Chuck's hey, word for it. Mike, Mike, it's Mike, here. Mike, you know, <laughs> okay, guys, let's let our author get back, and so we can end this on a more positive note. No, we're, we're out of time. Yes. Um, I want to thank you for inviting me to meeting number three thousand two hundred eighty-eight. I will always remember that. Um, this has been great fun. Uh, thanks. I'm not going to rebut anything that's been said because it's a free speech forum and everybody can say what they like. Um, I want to thank those of you who have, uh, you know, bought the book this evening. And you know, anyone else who wants to certainly can. Uh, if you finish reading it, you enjoy it. Enjoyed it? Please post a review on the internet. It always helps. If you don't like it, just come kind of under your head. <laughs> uh, I want to leave you with one little uh, bit of history interest. 
And that is, when again, when I taught sixth graders, they would go crazy sometimes saying, Mr. Blackman, what if? And they'd go into all kinds of these possible scenarios. Well, there's a wonderful book called What If? And it's a, it's a study called Contrafactual History. And it's basically, what if one little thing happened that didn't happen? How would that change the course of history? And I can just think of a couple examples here. Um, one of them that's there is in this book is uh, Alexander the Great and his very first battle against the Persians. Um, got way ahead of his forces and was completely surrounded by Persians and was about to be killed uh, when his, uh, fam his, his loyal bodyguard jumped in and saved his life. And this is actually recorded history. The what if there is, what if that hadn't happened and what if there was no Hellenistic age yeah, throughout the entire Middle throughout the, the Middle East and the countries that he conquered. Another one would be the Battle of Midway. I once did a TV show with Woody Hayes, who was a, a military historian by, by a hobby, and he talked about the Battle of Midway being the greatest underdog victory in the history of, of warfare. As you know, most of our fleet was wiped out at Pearl Harbor, but some of the carriers were out of the port that day, so they were not destroyed. Um, we discovered the Japanese were heading towards Hawaii again, and we sent those carriers to uh, Midway, where we had cracked a code, and they were vastly outnumbered. Uh, it wouldn't have been a very pretty sight. But for some reason, the Japanese decided to land all of their planes on their aircraft carriers and rearm them from torpedoes to bombs, or bombs to torpedoes, which one it was. But they decided to rearm. As they were sitting on the decks, the American bombers went over. And there was no air cover, and they destroyed the Japanese. What if they hadn't decided to change? But World War II may have gone a totally different direction. Obviously, uh, I also did a, a documentary once with Aroldo Rivera called Lee, On Trial Lee Harvey Oswald. It was uh, on the 25th anniversary of the uh, Kennedy assassination. I did it from Dallas. And whether or not you believe there were other shooters, what if Oswald missed? What would have Kennedy's legacy been? What might have happened differently? These are interesting things to, to ponder, and they're fun. Uh, what, now, there is a what if in this story. Bessie uh, Tyler's son-in-law worked for her. His name was J.Q. Jett, and he was also a fraternal organizer, or organizer and joiner. And he answered an ad from uh, William Simmons, one of the last ads, Simmons, the last money he had. And he uh, went to the meeting and joined the Klan. And he's the one that came back to Bessie and to Edward and said, you know what, this is the kind of stuff we do really well. They need our help. What if they said no? What might have changed in history uh, as a result of that? And would the Klan have just died and gone away? So and that's what I want to leave you with that. That's, a, that's fascinating to me, history, where history is made up of people. And people make decisions. And if they make different decisions or something else happens, history changes. So with that, I say thank you, and I enjoyed the video. All right.